So again, welcome to this orientation on Open Journal Systems, which is an open source publication management system hosted by the Texas Digital Library. My name is Christy Park. I'm the director of the Texas Digital Library, and I'll be walking you through this orientation today. Um, we're going to do a quick overview of the capabilities of the OJS platform and the hosting service that TDL provides and give you some additional resources for training and practice in the OJS system. Here's our agenda for today. Um, I'll have a few introductory things to say and then do an overview of OJS itself and what you get with an OJS journal and the TDL journal hosting service. We'll talk about how to get started with an OJS journal, and then we'll move into a brief demo of the editorial workflow in OJS. We'll then wrap up with some additional resources and information, and I think have uh, plenty of time for questions and answers um, at the end of uh, the presentation and demo. However, if you have any questions at any point during this uh, webinar, please feel free to use the chat functionality in BlueJeans up in the, I think, the upper right-hand corner. You'll see a chat window. You can enter your questions in there, and I will pause periodically throughout the presentation to, to see what questions there are and address them if I'm able to. First, a word about the Texas Digital Library. TDL is a consortium of higher education institutions that builds capacity for preserving, managing, and providing access to unique digital collections of enduring value. As part of our mission to support research efforts at our member institutions, as well as increase access to the results of research, the TDL hosts academic journals using the Open Journal Systems platform for our members who subscribe to this service. OJS is an open source, online, peer review friendly publication management system that facilitates open access publishing of the results of research. More than 6,500 journals worldwide use the OJS platform, which assists, as we'll see, with every stage of the refereed publishing process, from submission to peer review, to copy editing and layout, and finally to publication and indexing. It is a product of the Public Knowledge Project, which is a nonprofit research education and software development project from Stanford and Simon Fraser Universities. EKP's mission is to improve the quality of scholarly research and increase access to the published results. Okay, so what is TDL's role in this? Any, any successful hosted journal is a collaboration among multiple parties. The Texas Digital Library provides hosting and technical support for the journal, while the journal's editorial team undertakes the hard work of policy setting, workflow decision making, and editorial workflow management. Member institutions, TDL's member institutions, sit in the middle there and provide another important layer of support, serving as liaisons between the TDL and the editorial teams of the journals and providing value-added services in some cases, like consulting on scholarly communications issues. Some institutions may also have requirements or approval processes for new journal creation at their institution. With any journal request received by the TDL, the TDL contacts the institutional representatives at the journal manager's home institution to ensure that all layers of the support system are in place. I'm going to move right into um, a few slides about what you get with an OJS journal, just a really high level overview. At the most basic level, of course, you get a public facing website for the journal where readers can see published articles and issues, information about journal policies, an RSS feed, and navigation tools. They can see a table of contents uh, with each, for each issue. Uh, which is automatically generated by the system. And they can see an archive of back issues arranged in reverse chronological order. Uh, 
Um, with OJS, uh, the journal management web interface gives journal managers the ability to do some simple customizations to the way the journal looks and works. It comes with about a dozen preset themes and the ability to add logos, headers, and footers. And you can also add static web pages and customize sidebar content as well. For more advanced customization of the journal look and feel, OJS provides the capability to upload customized CSS style sheets through the journal management web interface. TDL does not currently provide CSS customization um, for these journals, but the system allows any individual journal editorial team to do that level of customization for themselves. Along with the public facing interface, OJS comes with a back end publication management system that helps editors manage the peer review process with tools for assigning and communicating with reviewers who can then log their reviews and recommendations in the system. And this is a screenshot of, of part of that back end peer review management interface, which we'll look at a little bit later in more depth. There are also tools for managing editorial tasks like copy editing, layout, and issue creation. Um, and a really important component of this workflow management system is version control. OJS keeps track of the multiplicity of versions of the manuscript throughout the review and revision process so that you, know, you always know uh, which version you're working with. OJS also provides customizable form emails that are automatically generated at various decision points in the editorial process, like when you assign a reviewer to a submission, as you see on this, in this screenshot. These emails, along with all other decisions and actions taken on a submission, are logged in the system so that journal managers and editors have a complete and documented history of all editorial decisions. And finally, OJS comes with a number of search engine optimization and indexing tools that help raise the profile of your journal and track its usage. These tools include a Google Analytics plugin that lets you track website usage and downloads through Google's powerful analytics system. There are also export tools for exporting content to other indexing systems like Crossref and the directory of open access journals um, that require you to uh, submit various kinds of information about journal issues and articles. So overall, what OJS does really, really well is help you manage the workflows around scholarly publishing and journal publishing. Um, it, it's great at managing the communication, at managing all those versions, um, at helping you with indexing and uh, things like that. If you aren't doing peer review or copy editing, or you don't want to do those things in OJS, then you may want to consider using a content management system like WordPress to publish your articles rather than OJS. Um, another just note, um, another caveat is that OJS doesn't provide tools for doing the copy editing or layout, just the tools for managing workflow and communication around those processes. You have to have PDF or HTML creation tools for making those final proofs of articles that go in the published issues. So you have to, to do those things outside the system and then upload them into the system. So it's just important distinction to know going in. I'm gonna pause here for a minute before we move on into how to get started with a journal to see if there are any questions so far. Okay. All right. So uh, let's move on into the next section, getting started. So we're going to talk about how to request a new journal, um, understanding roles in OJS, which is an important um, part of how the system works, and the initial setup of a journal by the journal manager. So when um, a, a journal editorial team or management team decides that they would like to set up a new open journal systems journal hosted by TDL, they can simply email our help desk at support at tdl.org. 
um, they should be able to provide a few pieces, key pieces of information as soon as possible before we'll be able to approve and set up the journal. They need to be able to tell us the name of the journal, um, its focus and scope, their institutional affiliation so that we can make sure they're from an institution that subscribes to our journal hosting service. Um, whether they have an open access policy and what their open access policy is for their journal. They also need to tell us a URL slug, which is that last little bit of the URL. All of our journals by default have a, have a web address that is formatted as journals.tdl.org slash something. And um, typically that last slug is something representative of the journal's title. And then finally, they need to be able to give us the name and email address for at least one of the journal's managers so that we can set them up as a journal manager in the system. Once we have this information, we will review it and approve it, contact the institutional liaison at the member institution um, that the journal managers are affiliated with and get started setting up the journal in our infrastructure. Um, once that happens, then the journal managers can begin um, getting into the journal to set it up, and we're going to um, go over that some now. Before we do that, though, um, I just want to take one beat to, to talk a little bit about the publishing workflow in very high-level terms so that we can see as we go through the editorial process later and the, the setup process um, now, we can see how these things map onto um, the OJS interface. So just in very general simplified terms, we have an author who submits a manuscript to kind of kick off this process. Then the editors of the journal would do an initial review of that manuscript to decide whether it's worth reviewing, whether it's within scope. If it is, they would, they would send it to one or more peer reviewers to review that manuscript, provide feedback and a recommendation about what to do with that manuscript. If the peer reviewers think it's great, um, and then the editors will then make an editorial decision about what to do with it. Um, they can make one of several decisions about the manuscript. They might accept it for publication outright. They might reject it and return it to the author and they're done with it. They might tell the author, um, we will accept it if you make these revisions or they might return it to the author with suggestions for revision, but require that they resubmit it for another round of review. Those are pretty standard editorial decisions across scholarly publishing, um, the scholarly publishing world, um, and those represent the decisions available to editors in the OJS interface as well. If it's accepted, the manuscript would then go into the kind of editing phase of the process and uh, would go through copy editing where you get the text right, layout editing to make sure it looks like um, the format that the journal has um, decided on, and proofreading to check the final proof for any errors. At that point, it, the uh, article could be assigned to a future issue and um, get ready for publication um, to the world. So all of these stages of the publishing process are represented in various ways in the um, editorial workflow management of uh, OJS. One of the ways that, that um, OJS manages all this work is through the use of roles. Roles are the way it organizes activities and spaces within, within the system. Um, and so it's important to kind of understand what these ro roles allow a user to do. So it's important to note that users can have more than one role. So any user can be both a journal manager and an editor, for instance. 
and also that multiple users can hold the same role. So you could have a team of six editors or a whole bunch of reviewers, what have you. This is the list of possible roles that any user can um, have in OJS. They can be a journal manager who sets up the journal and journal policies and manages user permissions and user roles. The editor who oversees the editorial workflow and creates and publishes issues. Uh, a section editor, which is an optional role um, in which the user would manage the editorial process just for one subset of articles or a type of article. OJS has, uh, you can assign users um, to be reviewers in OJS. Those are the peer reviewers who take assigned articles and make recommendations for publication. And of course, you have some users who are assigned as authors. You have to have the author role to submit an article to, OJ, to an OJS journal. Then you have a, a few other additional roles that are optional um, that are highly specialized editing roles. So you can have a user who only has the copy editor role and their role, their job would be to come in and just do the copy editing uh, on, a, on a manuscript or layout editing or proofreading. Um, in a lot of the journals that TDL hosts, which typically are small and have small staffs, you don't have people who undertake those highly specialized roles, and instead you might have an editor um, or a section editor who takes on that work, all of that work for any given manuscript. OJS can support both types of workflows. So we have um, then, once the journal is set up, um, a journal manager would come in and do the initial setup and prep for the journal. And this slide is an effort to kind of highlight some of the things that any journal management team needs to think about before they are ready to set up their journal. These five steps um, represented by the, the bolded terms across the top there represent the five steps of the journal setup process in OJS. And this gives a pretty good representation of the basic kinds of policies and other things that a team needs to think about and, and have a grasp on before they're ready to set things up. So you have your basic information, of course, the title of the journal and contact info, but also um, an ISSN number or DOI prefix if your journal is going to um, register for those things. Various policies uh, for the journal overall, for submission guidelines, things that you're going to require authors to do or agree to, like a copyright statement. Workflow decisions about how the peer review process is going to work, how you're going to staff your journal, and how often you're going to publish. And then um, any design work that you want to do for your journal. So whether you're going to create a, or have a logo or header graphics, um, how you want to format your articles um, for publication, uh, what information you want on the journal website, if you want custom sidebars or custom static pages, and whether you're going to do any um, CSS uh, design customizations um, in the setup for your journal. I've also included a resource on this slide that's provided by PKP called Basic Work, Flan Work Plan for Journals. This is a great resource for just thinking through all of the preparatory work that needs to be done when setting up a new journal. And I've noted here that, you know, you can ignore the first few topics dealing with technical infrastructure and installation of the software because that's what TDL um, does for you. But this is a, a really uh, good, solid, uh, comprehensive resource for new journal managers. I'm going to pause here and we're going to take a look in a demo journal at this journal setup interface so that you can kind of get start getting a sense of what the interface looks like. Uh, are there any questions before I move on? Okay, 
So you should now be seeing a screen that has our demo journal, the Journal of Puppy Studies. Before it ends, Excuse me, Christy? Yeah, I see we've got a couple of questions. Yep, a couple of questions just popped up. Okay, thanks. So do you have to be journal manager to edit CSS? You have to have a journal manager role to upload the the new CSS files into the um, interface. So there's a spot in there, and I'll show it to you actually when we get into the, the setup, um, where you can upload a new style sheet or various style sheets. So you have to have journal manager permissions to do that upload. Um, but um, the if, if a journal wants to do some CSS customization, then they could ask us to provide them with the style sheets and um, anybody could edit them, you know, outside of the system and then they could be uploaded by a journal manager. I hope that answers the question. Uh, second question, what is the URL for the resource you just mentioned? Okay, let me, I'll put it in the, um, I'll put it in the, uh, here it is, in the chat. So that you can, okay, I think there's the resource, or the URL for that basic work plan. And Santi, if a journal is interested in generating a DOI with their publications, is this something that TDL can mint? That's a great question, Sandy. Um, right now, TDL does not um, mint DOIs or register DOIs for OJS journals. Um, it's the responsibility of the journal manager to register with Crossref, um, register the journal and make the necessary payments and, and all that stuff to get DOIs for journal articles. There are tools in the OJS platform for um, assigning the DOIs, you know, in a particular order uh, automatically once you have a prefix. And there are also tools for doing the necessary exports um, of metadata to Crossref, which they require in order to, to get everything registered appropriately. There are lots of tools in the platform for managing DOI, minting and registration, but we do not, uh, we just don't have the resources to do that for every journal. So um, it is also something that a member institution, it could be a value added service that a member institution provides um, for uh, users at their institution. Um, and then Justin asked, could OJS integrate handles and could TDL support that? I looked into this a little bit, Justin, just recently. And as far as I can tell, um, there's no support for handles in OJS out of the box. So you'd have, I know, <laughs> I know. So you'd have to have a handle service running kind of outside of OJS, which would be possible, but not ideal. Um, DOIs are better. Um, for this purpose. Those are all great questions. Is there anything else? Okay, so let's look at the journal setup. And I'm going to warn you that um, there's a lot in the journal manager interface that we're not going to cover today for reasons of time. Uh, but my hope is that this can give everybody at least a little bit of comfort level in the interface itself. And I'll give you some resources for exploring on your own um, after the webinar if you're interested in, in learning more. So this is our Journal of Puppy Studies. And um, you can see this is a pretty typical OJS site. We have a banner image across the top. Um, I'm trying to remember which theme this is, but it's one of the preset themes in OJS. We have a you know, table of contents from the most recently published journal. And you see all of these uh, uh, 
um, automatically generated navigational links across the top of the journal. We also have a custom link that I've added that goes to the TVL website. That one I added myself. Everything else up here is just kind of out of the box. I'm going to go ahead and log in as a journal manager. And you can see that this, once I log in, it takes me to my user home where I can see all of the roles that I have in this journal. Um, I'm a site administrator, which is a role that only TVL has in any journal. But um, I also have journal manager access, editor access, and reviewer access. Right now, I'm just interested in the journal manager access. And in particular, I'm interested in this uh, quick link over here, which is journal setup. So that's where I'm going to go. All right. So you can see on this page um, that we're on step one of the journal setup, getting down the details. But right underneath that, you can see the five steps of the setup process. I'm not going to go through each one of these in detail, but I just want you to see that basically this setup process is a process of filling out a bunch of forms, a bunch of fields and metadata about the journal, including ISSN if you have one, um, contact information, your technical support contact, which we encourage people to fill in with the TDL help desk um, so that users of the journal will contact our help desk if they have technical issues with the journal and various other things in here. We move on to step two, policies. You can enter information about the focus and scope, your peer review policy, and any review guidelines that you want to provide to reviewers when they come in to, to look at an article. And then you have to make a decision about the review process. And this is something I like to pause on because OJS gives journals um, a couple of different models for, for doing this. So, which they call the standard review process and the email attachment review process. The standard review process is ideal for journal managers because with this, when you notify a reviewer that you want them to come do a review, then they will come log in to the journal website complete the review and enter their recommendation directly into the journal site. Um, if you feel like you have reviewers who aren't going to be willing to do that, you can choose the email attachment review process um, by which you would simply handle all the communication back and forth with the reviewer by email and you would attach the manuscript that you want them to review to the email and then they would attach their review and recommendation to an email back to you. In that process, the editor would then have to upload or um, add any information from the reviewer back into the system themselves rather than the reviewer doing it directly. So I hope that distinction makes sense. Um, this is making this decision here, whether you choose standard review or email attachment, review is really just about setting the default and you can um, you know dive, diverge from that default in any particular case once you're in the editorial workflow. So there's all kinds of things you can set up here um, related to the review workflow and um, other things related to let's see policies. I want to point out to here at the end, there is a section on journal archiving. Um, OJS is compatible with LOCKS. However, TDL is not a member of a LOCKS network. We are exploring right now, um, Courtney Mumar, our digital preservation expert, is exploring um, a PKP-related preservation um, system um, that we're hoping we can use to uh, archive and preserve all of our journal contents. Um, and it, oh, it actually is this PKP PLN um, network. So hopefully very soon we'll be able to let people use this um, and it will make the service even more robust.
step three is um, submission policies and procedures where you enter author guidelines. You can enter, um, you can create a submission preparation checklist, which authors have to agree to um, when they submit a um, article for, for review. You have a management tab that has a bunch of miscellaneous settings on it, including um, this is where you set up your open access policy. And it's, I'll reiterate that TDL does require, it's really our, one of our only requirements for um, journals that we host, other than that they be at a member institution that subscribes to the service, uh, is that they have some sort of open access policy for their journal. You can set up your publication schedule and frequency here. And this is where you might set up um, the pattern with which you want to assign DOIs to uh, your journal. So if you have a DOI, you can set uh, the journal up to assign DOIs to issues, to published items, to each individual galley, um, and to supplemental article files if you want to. And then the final step in the setup is the look, which is where you can do some of your customizations. So for instance, as I've done here, you can upload a title image, a banner file um, to be your journal homepage header. You could also just have title text that would appear um, plainly across the front. Well, I really should have alt text for my, my um, for my image here. You can add a journal logo, a thumbnail, and you can do the same for any of the non, oh wait, this is journal homepage content, sorry. There are other pieces of information you can add to the journal homepage here. You can have a description of the journal. You can have a homepage image that just appears in the body um, portion of the home page and you can decide whether you want the table of contents for the current issue to appear on the home page then you can do all a lot of the same work for the journal pages behind the home page whether you want a banner or whatever you can create a footer you can add custom links to the top navigation bar. Here's where I added the TDL website link. And you can do some very basic work with the theme and the layout of the journal. So um, here where it says journal theme, I have a, a drop down menu with all the available kind of preset prefab themes that I can choose for the journal. Um, to give it a little bit different look and feel. I've got it in the custom theme plugin. There is a plugin in this in our hosted journals that lets you do just a teeny little bit of customization. You can change the colors basically is what you could do using that custom theme and we can look at that later um, if we have time. This is where you would upload a journal style sheet if you had a customized style sheet that you've been working with. And you can also move blocks of information around from the right sidebar where they are by default to the left sidebar, or you can um, unselect the things in the right sidebar. For instance, if I didn't want that author biography block appearing at all, I could highlight it and move it into the center column and it wouldn't appear on the public side at all can also move these things around. So if I want my, let's see, I want the web feed plugin to be the first thing in the right sidebar. I could just move it up here. Okay. There are a few other things here too. There are these um, little information blocks 
that appear in the right sidebar that have bits of information for different constituencies of the journal, for authors, readers, librarians, you can um, populate those with information. These actually do come with a uh, boilerplate out of the box. They have been deleted from this training journal, but typically there's some boilerplate OJS language in these to help authors and others uh, find their way. So those are basically the five steps of the journal setup process. And that gets you a long way towards setting up the journal and being able to use it effectively. I'm gonna step back a little bit. Um, I'm gonna go back to my user home, which is wh where I was when I first logged in, and go back into this journal manager section. which shows you all the things that you can do as a journal manager. And as I said before, there's just a ton of stuff in here that we're not gonna be able to go over. But I, I wanted everybody to see it um, and just point out a couple of things here so you know where to look. Um, one is, you can see here the setup link, that's where we just were. And um, there are lots of other things you can do in, in terms of managing the journal. You can create customized review forms for peer reviewers to use. You can set up your different journal sections and different policies for each one. You can work with the form emails that we're going to see as we go through the editorial workflow. Those, are, those all exist at this link and you can go in and edit them um, to customize them however you however you need. You also have some stats and reports. This is pretty minimal stuff available through directly through the OJS platform, but you can also in the system plugins set up Google Analytics to um, track usage of your journal. And there are a bunch of import and export plugins. So um, I see Justin asking about the quick submit plugin and it is in fact installed by default. So it should be here in the import export data section. There it is, the quick submit plugin. And this lets you um, really quickly get um, publication ready proofs into the, into the journal, assign them immediately to an issue, and they go directly to the end of the editorial workflow so that you don't have to take it through the whole workflow process or editorial workflow process to get it into an issue. This is really useful for um, dealing with back issues of a journal, say, if you're migrating from a, a print journal to um, online and you have a bunch of PDFs, you just need to get in there quickly. This is a useful tool for that. You can see also there are all of the export things for things like a data site. So if you were getting um, DOIs from data site, Crossref, DOAJ, many others. The journal management section also has um, all of the user management stuff in it. So if you needed to add users to um, the journal site, you can do that here by creating a new user, a very simple form that manages all of it. It will suggest a username for you. It will create a password for you and send um, the user an email asking them to log in. Um, you can also enroll existing users. So if you have a, somebody who's an author in the journal but you wanna add them as a reviewer, you can enroll that user using the enroll user from this site in this journal link. Um, and a bunch of other, a bunch of other uh, things. You can also just see who's in your journal as what role. So if I wanted to see all of the reviewers in my journal, I can click there and I get the list. And with any of these lists, you can see, I can see the username, 
the name of the person, their email address. I can send them an email from in here by just clicking on this little letter icon. I can unenroll them, edit them, edit their profile. I can log in as them, which is useful for troubleshooting if you're um, trying to see what somebody else has been seeing or if you need to get in and do something that you're waiting on a section editor to do, you could uh, log in as them and do it. You can also disable users um, from logging into your site at all. So journal managers have a good bit of control over user, user access in the system. Okay, let's see. I think that is all I'm going to cover on journal manager um, work, uh, and we'll move into the editorial workflow. Unless there are any questions about any of these things, anything that's piqued your interest, or, or questions that you have from what I've talked about. Okay. All right then. So then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to log out as a journal manager and we're going to start looking at the, uh, we're going to look next at the author submission workflow. So I'm going to log in with a user account that I know is an author. Hey Christy, Santi had a question. Oh sure. Thanks. Thanks, Leah. You so bet. once you complete the five-step setup process and save, are you able to go back later and add and make changes? Yes, you can always go back in um, and, and change that information. It's never, ever locked in. Yep. Okay, so now I'm locked in to, or I'm logged in to an author, um, user account and you can see once I've locked I've logged in I've gone to this active submissions page where I can see any submissions that I have currently which there for which I don't have any there's a start a new submission link and then there's a section showing ref backs so if any of my articles that have been published um, get referred to linked back to that will appear here as well which is a nice feature for authors but for now, I just want us to go through this, uh, a new submission. So I'm going to click here to st start the new submission. And again, this is another quick five-step process. I'm going to go through this really quickly. I want to point out that um, at the top here, you have uh, a section that says encountering difficulties, contact TDL Help Desk for assistance. That is um, from the journal management setup where it asked us to put a TDL or a, a technical support contact. Um, whatever you put there would, would appear here in the submission workflow for, for um, authors to see and contact if they have issues. Okay, so this is a pretty simple process. The author will have to select the section of the journal that they think their submission belongs in. They'll have to read through and agree to the submission checklist that you set up in the journal setup portion. It's not been previously published. I've provided URLs for references. It's single spaced and formatted the way they, the journal managers have said it should be. It adheres to the author guidelines and I've read the ensuring a blind review information here to remove any identifying information. Ugh, taking forever, so I'm going to close it. But just know that OJS provides default instructions for ensuring a blind review, which is basically just telling authors, take the author names out of um, the text, take it out of the um, you know, embedded information in Microsoft Word or, P or your PDF um, before you submit it so that we can ensure a blind review. The authors agree to your copyright notice and they read the privacy statement for your journal explaining what they're going to use your name and email address for. 
and they can provide any comments to the editor. And then they'll go to the next step and upload the manuscript. Okay, there are instructions there for them. Um, let's see. I'm going to upload my article. And then you'll see that um, the submission file is here. It's a Word doc. Um, you have the original file name and the date and time it was uploaded. You also see that OJS um, renames the file. And we'll see uh, that there's a pattern to the way the naming conventions work as this file goes through different versions throughout the editorial process. Um, and I can't tell you that I know what every single one of these numbers means, but I do know that that 107 is the um, submission ID. So this is going to be submission number 107 in the system. And that SM indicates that this is the submission version of the document. And that SM will change throughout the course of the manuscript's life. I'm going to save and continue. I have uh, the opportunity to add some metadata. My information, user information, has been populated. I can add to it if I want to. And um, add my abstract. Let's see. What's the name of my... I had fun um, with a, a, a academic paper title generator getting ready for this. Enter my title and abstract. Any metadata, descriptive metadata that um, the journal managers have asked me to provide. This is another thing that we didn't see when we were in the journal manager setup, but journal managers can um, set which uh, descriptive fields they want authors to fill out when um, they're submitting. These are the three that um, had been selected. And any contributors and supporting agencies for my submission. I'm going to save and continue, and it'll ask me if I have any supplementary files to upload. I don't, so I'm going to save and continue, and I come to the end. It's going to ask me to review and click Finish Submission when I'm satisfied with it. I'm going to go ahead and do that, and it will ask me if I want to go back to the Active Submissions page, which was that first page I started on. And you can see here that I now have a, an active submission in queue. It's submission number 107, has the date it was submitted, my name and title, and a status awaiting assignment. So an author can always come back to this page and see what part of the editorial workflow their submission is in as it's going through that workflow. Okay, that's it for the author submission uh, process. Any questions before we move into the editorial workflow? The submitter elects to include supplemental files of those be made available alongside the article. Yeah, so assuming the article is published, so those, mm, I think there are, there are a number of answers to that question. So the supplementary materials would be made available to the peer reviewers, assuming they didn't have any identifying information in them. And I think the editor has the choice about whether to allow the reviewers to see them or not. Um, I think it, whether they're made available alongside the article or not is somewhat dependent on how things are set up. So I've seen some um, journals that ask um, ask for image files or things like that, image files, let's say, to be submitted separately from the manuscript as supplemental files. And then during the layout, um, 
work that they do to get an article ready for publication, those image files might end up embedded in the main text of the article, but that would be the job of the layout editor to sort of create that final proof. Um, in some cases, they are just supplementary files that are appear along with the, um, alongside the, the article, and it's up to the editors to decide whether those things go with it or not, but it is possible. Um, there is a way to create a practice journal, and I will, yes, I'm going to explain how to do that or, you know, how to ask us to do that for you um, later on, but we will definitely um, provide that for you if you're interested in it. Okay, I'm going to look real quickly now. I'm going to log back out as author and go back in as an editor. And you can see I'm back in as TDL admin and I have my journal rent manager role here, but right now I'm interested in the editor stuff. And you can see here a little overview of everything that's in the editorial queue. There are 11 unassigned articles. There are five that are in review and one that's in the editing queue. Um, I'm gonna go into the unassigned portion and see that I have 11 articles in here that haven't been assigned to anybody, so I'm really behind on my work. But I want to look for the one I just submitted, which is uh, 107, Rodriguez. So there I am, the article I just submitted. And I'm going to go in and look at this one. And you can see here across the top, um, we're on the summary page, the one that's bolded. But there are several different tabs or links associated with Submission 107, um, review, editing, the hist history, which is a log of all the actions taken, and references, which I kind of skimmed over a little bit in the journal manager section, but we can return to this a little bit if we have time. Um, Right now, though, I just want to review the metadata, everything about this article. You see the original file name here, um, the status is awaiting assignment, all of the submission metadata that the author provided is here, which I can edit if I want to. Now, um, this is the point where the editorial staff needs to make that initial call about whether or not to send it to review. So they might do an initial editorial review. If they decide it's not worth reviewing or it is out of scope for the journal, they can click this reject and archive submission link, which will generate an automatic email to the submitter um, saying they've done an initial review and it just doesn't fit. Um, it's not gonna be appropriate for the journal. And then it gets archived and you're done. But I'm gonna cancel that. Instead, I'm gonna assign an editor to work with this article. I'm gonna assign myself, but I could assign somebody else. So I'm gonna record that. And now I'm the, the editor of record for this um, submission. And I'm going to go over into the review tab and select some peer reviewers to come and, and take a look at the submission. So with each of these tabs in here, you have um, information about the submission up here at the top. Um, this will look familiar on each page. And I'll want to note here that where it says review version, we have a new file name on the review page. Instead of SM, we have RV, indicating that this is the review document. Um, and the system really wants you to check and, you know, check out the ensuring a blind peer review. What do I need to do to make sure this is going to go out blind? So this review version, whatever's here, is what's going to go out to reviewers. So the editor would want to make sure that everything is taken out. If this version that gets here automatically does have identifying information, they might want to download this document, remove all that identifying information, and then re-upload a revised review version. So if I did that, if I uploaded a new version, 
you can see here now that I have 1073262 RV, meaning this is the this is re uh, review version number two. So the system is really keeping track of all these different versions. Okay, so I'm going to assign peer reviewers. To do that, I go down to the peer review section, click select reviewer, and it'll it'll show me a list of possible uh, peer reviewers for this article. And one thing you can log in OJS, which we haven't done for any of our fake reviewers, is reviewing interests so that you can find somebody who is appropriate for this particular article. I'm going to go ahead and assign um, one of our more popular reviewers, John Hamm, to this uh, assign, or to this article. Take me back to the review page, and now you can see John Hamm is our first reviewer. All that means is that he's assigned in the system. He doesn't know it yet. So we have to send him a request email. And there's, again, a little letter icon that I can click, which generates a form email asking him to come into the system and review it. It gives him a due date. Um, and that due date is, is set. There's a default setting for that in the journal manager setup. It gives him a link that he can click to get into the system and get to the, um, the article. And it provides him with the name and the abstract for the submission. Get the email for now. But you can see it logs the date on which I sent him the request. He'll get that email and since since I have a little bit of time, I'm going to log out really quickly. Oh, no, I didn't need to do that. Sorry, guys. I'm going to go in here and log in as John Ham. And now you can see what he sees when the reviewer comes into the system. He sees his active submissions. That link in the email that he gets will take him directly to this page. Um, and he can see everything about the um, submission to be reviewed, when it's due. He can notify the editor whether he's going to do it. And so if he is going to do it, he can send us an email um, saying so. And then, um, there are the rest of the steps of the of the process. Um, he can download the manuscript, enter his review in the review form that we've assigned to him, which is a very, <laughs> very uh, blunt instrument. The way that we've set it up in the in this uh, um, in this test journal, but that's all customizable. He can upload any additional files if he has a long review he, he wants to, in a Word document that he wants to upload, he can do that. And then he can choose a recommendation. Accept, require revisions, resubmit, resubmit elsewhere, or decline submission. Um, assuming he uh, likes the article, he will submit his recommendation and then that will automate another email to come back to the editor saying that the the review is complete and he's done so we'll stop pretending to be a reviewer now and go back into our submission as an editor you can see now that in my queue 107 is highlighted in green, which means all reviewers have returned with their comments, but no decision is recorded. So I'm going to go back in there. And I can see that he has what his recommendation was. I can look at the review form response that he submitted and everything else. I can also assign a second reviewer if I if we need multiple reviewers, etc. Okay. So let's assume 
that. We've had two or three positive reviews of this article and we're ready to make a decision. Once, the, once all the reviews are in, then the editorial team would make a decision about what to do with it. And they'd come down here to this final section of the review page to choose whether to accept or one of the other options. We're gonna accept it and record the decision. It wants us to be sure And it wants us to notify the author before we do anything else with it. So there's again a little bit, a little mail icon that we click. We'll generate another form email. Congrats. Oh, well, we have to fill in some gaps on this one. And we'll see. Again, the system logs this interaction, this communication, and the date on which it happened, and we're ready to send this article to copy editing. It, it wants us to choose a version, though, for copy editing. So um, right now we have the review version, which is the, the one that we sent out um, to the reviewers, which is probably blind, it has all the identifying information. As the editor version, which, to be honest, I'm not sure whether that is the original submission or something different. And if the author had written back to our notification email with a new version, then that would appear here as an option too. Um, or you can choose a new file um, here and upload it by selecting whichever radio button you want, probably the editor version, and uploading a new version here. But whichever version you send to copy editing, you want it to be one that has that identifying information back in it now that the review process is over. Okay, so I'm gonna send this one to copy editing. I've selected it, click send to copy editing. And now the system is gonna take me into the editing portion of the queue. So I'm not going to walk us through every part of this because it's lengthy and tedious um, and probably pretty self-explanatory, but the, I will point out a couple things. So the, the editing page is broken into several sections um, that are somewhat linear in terms of the process, um, but not entirely. So you have copy editing and space for doing three rounds of copy editing for the manuscript. It's not absolutely required that anybody do all three rounds, but the system is assuming that the editorial staff in some capacity will do an initial round of copy editing with this document, and that then they will send it to the author who will respond to the revision requests of the copy editing team and make the edits. And then the editorial team, and then, well, of course, the author will send it back through the system. And then the editorial team will look at it one more time and do a final copy edit to have a full, complete version of, um, clean version of the manuscript. Once that's done, the layout team would take over, assuming that there's a separate team. It may just be the editor of the journal is doing all of this. Um, and the editor would take that clean copy edited version and format it as appropriate for the journal, depending on the journal's guidelines. Um, the layout version is the final copy edited version of the manuscript here. Okay. And you can um, upload that by coming down here where it says upload file to and you select which area here you want to upload it to and choose the file. So you have your layout version. The editor would take that Word document, turn it into a galley or final proof. In OJS, OJS supports a number of different kinds of galleys. Um, most typically, the galleys would be in PDF format or HTML format. 
um, and you can upload either one. So, but the key here is that you would have to upload an HTML document for it to be an HTML page in OJS. So you have to have an HTML editor to create the HTML file that you're gonna upload here as the galley. Um, lots and lots of people just create PDFs um, formatted in the, according to the style guidelines of the journal and upload that as the galley, which is what we're gonna do here. So uh, we have our layout version, we wanna select galley and find our PDF version of the article that we've created and upload it. When we upload it, the system um, identifies it as a PDF um, and will populate this label field as PDF. That is the label that will appear in the table of contents of the journal when it's published that people would click on to get to the PDF. But you could change that label to anything. Um, and there's some other information here uh, about the file itself. You can save it. Now if we scroll down to the layout section again, we see our galley here. And we can view the proof just to see what it looks like. Here it is. Um, we can replace that. We could add another galley. So I could have a PDF version of the article and an HTML version. I can add the supplemental files if I want to. Oh, well here, supplemental files up here. Um, and I can also create a remote galley. So to create, you're creating a remote galley if you're hosting the actual articles in a different place, um, on a different website maybe. Um, and you can create a remote galley just by plugging in a URL and that is the, that is, that will create the link that people will see in the table of contents. Okay. Once the galley or the, the galley or the proof is done, then uh, a journal staff might take it through one final um, step of proofreading. Um, and again, the system has room for three rounds of proofreading, first by the author, then by a proofreader, and finally by the layout editor. This is all optional. Um, no, no journal has to do every one of these steps before it's ready to publish. One other thing on this page is the scheduling. And the scheduling can take place really at any point during the editorial process. But this is just um, how the, uh, the editors tell OJS which issue, which journal issue this article should be assigned to. So if I click the drop down menu, I will see a whole bunch of options here, I have all the back issues listed. Um, and uh, the any future issues that I've created, and I'll show you about how to, where you create new issues in just a second. But I've already created a future issue. This is an issue that's not published yet. And so I'm adding any, any new um, articles to that future issue. And I'll record that. Okay. okay. So um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm done with this particular manuscript. It's gone through the review process. It's gone through editing. We've created the galley and assigned it to an issue. So I'm ready to go look at my issues and see if I'm ready to publish. Um, but I'll just take a minute now again and pause and see if there are any questions so far. Okay, so I'm gonna go back up here to my breadcrumb up here and go back to the editor link. This is my editor homepage. And you can see up here, I have all the things I've been working with in terms of individual submissions. The second half of the page, I have all the things I can do related to issues. Um, I can create a new one, 
I can look at back issues, I can look at future issues. Since I'm, since I'm thinking about publishing, I'm going to go to future issues so I can look and see if we're ready to go. So I only have one future issue created, volume five, number two. And here I can see kind of a rough um, look at everything that's been assigned to this issue so far. And you can see I have two sections. I have a book review section and an article section. And each um, manuscript or, or article that's included in each one. I can move these things around. So if I want the Wilson article to be first, I can just click this up arrow and it will move to the, the first position. Um, I can move the sections around as well. You can see here um, in the proofed column, if the, this manuscript had gone through those three rounds of proofreading, then this box would be checked. It would tell me, okay, this one, we, proofreading's done, it's ready to go. Um, and down here, I can publish the issue if I'm ready. I'm gonna just quickly though, go up to the top here and show you these other tabs. So issue data, is all the, the metadata about the issue. Volume number, title, if I wanted to create cover art for the issue, I could do that. If I wanted to have a unique style sheet for this issue, I could upload it here, um, all kinds of other things. The issue galleys, honestly, Oh, so you can publish galleys with all of the content. So if you have a, I think this would be useful for print journals that do print and um, online as well. If they have a PDF version of the entire print version of the issue, they might upload it here as a single galley. Might also be useful for back issues of print um, journals as well. And then you can also preview the issue, which gives you the look that it will have um, once it's published. You can see, you can click on this link, the title, or the PDF link, and it will take you, well, the PDF link will take you directly to the PDF. And it's an embedded PDF, which I can expand if I want it to be Oh no, that makes it smaller, sorry. Full screen is what makes it uh, bigger. Um, or I can click on the link, title link, and it will take me to the kind of a splash page for the article itself, which gives me the article metadata and a link to full text. Back to my preview. And back to the issue, which is, I think, ready to be published. So I'm going to go back to my table of contents here and publish the issue. Yes, I'm sure. And now it is out there. So if I go to up here to the top nav and I go to the current issue page, I should see the issue that I just published. So it's now open to the public. Um, for, for others to come and read. And let me see. I want to point out that um, another thing that OJS does is it provides these reading tools on the right hand side um, for any article. So you can look at the abstract, you can print it, you can see the metadata. You can get citate for, um, the citation for the article in a bunch of different forms and standards. You can email the article or the author. All of this is pretty customizable. There's a section in the journal manager portion of the site called reading tools, and you can go in there and tell it which of these things you want available for any given article. Uh, and which things you want to hide. There's, there are actually a whole bunch more of these than are visible here in this journal. Okay, 
I'm going to go back to my home page. You can see the current the current uh, table of contents is here on the home page, and we're good to go. Um, are there any questions? I was I was going to mention too that once a journal is published or an issue is published, the editors can still go back in and change things. So if I go um, if I go back to my user home and excuse this mess, this is we've got a bunch of different journals on this particular site, and so it's a little messy. So here's my TDL training journal, which is what I'm in. I can always go back in now that it's published. It's a back issue. I can go into the back issues and find the one that's up right now, and I can delete things from this issue, or I can go into the article itself and upload a different proof or make changes. So, um, so there are always ways to go back and fix things if you need to. We also have uh, a couple of journals that publish as articles are ready. So they have maybe a single issue for the year and they publish that issue as soon as the first article is ready. And then as soon as the second article is ready, they just keep publishing to that same issue so that things come up um, as, they're, as they make their way through the editorial process. Um, Justin's asking about if OJS interacts in any way with the digital preservation service TDL provides. Currently, uh, there's no sort of automated interaction with digital preservation services, but as I mentioned, we're actively working on getting the PKP um, locks service set up with our OJS implementations so that um, articles and issues will be preserved through that. And I think that will be the best pathway for the OJS journals rather than trying to ingest them into um, Deepin or, or one of our other existing services. Mm. Now, for back issues that are sitting somewhere else, um, we could definitely talk about where they where we could preserve them. That would just be kind of a separate project from OJS. Um, so if you've got content that needs to be in dark storage and and um, you know a good di distributed digital digital preservation system, then we've got options for doing that. We could talk with Courtney about what the best ones are. Yeah. Yeah, and back issues of journals, I mean, DSpace would be a pretty good place for them, potentially, rather than content DM. Okay. Um, so, Let's um let's see what other questions there are, and then I've got just a few more slides to kind of wrap things up. But we've got a little bit of time for more questions if you have them about the editorial process. You ready to wrap things up? Okay. Well, let's go back to our slides really briefly. We'll get through this pretty quickly. I want to just make a few comments about partnering with TDL for journal hosting and then provide you with some additional resources. So we looked at this shot before. As I mentioned, this is a collaboration between us, the editorial teams that actually do most of the hard work of managing the journal, and the institutions, we have a and libraries listed here, but any one of our member institutions who subscribe to this service um, can provide uh, meaningful support to the editorial teams as well. This slide just lists what we see as our responsibilities versus others in this collaboration. So we provide the hosting, 
um, of an OJS installation for each journal, including the maintenance, upgrades, backup, and troubleshooting. We offer our help desk for journal staff and readers. We do training of library liaisons, plus regular public orientation webinars like this one. We are trying to get away from on-demand um, training of each new journal staff. Um, and, and so we're going to be doing these regular webinars as well as trying to do more providing of documentation and self-service training videos for new journal uh, members and training up our library liaisons a little bit more so that they can provide support as well as needed. Our member libraries can provide other value-added services. For instance, they could provide DOI registration services and other scholarly communication consulting or support. Um, they can make institution-level policies. So we have some institutions that where the library wants to approve any new journal before TDL um, will host it, and we respect those institution level policies. And we ask them that they, we ask that they maintain enough familiarity with the service to get a, a new journal manager started or to help new journal managers as they're getting started. And then finally, journal managers and their editorial teams are responsible for editorial policy making and work, um, design work, registration of their journal with external indexers like Crossref, and maintenance of an open access policy. This slide has a link to the training journal, and I'm going to, we will send this out to everybody who's on the call today afterwards um, so that you can access it. You can also just email us at support at tdl.org and we will provide you we can set you up with your own journal on that site and give you appropriate access to it so that you can just play around as much as you want to. Um, the training, just a word of caution, the training sites that we run, we run only during business hours, basically, um, to, to save a little money. So those are available from 7.30 to 5.30 um, on weekdays. So if, if the site is down, which has happened to me a few times, I'll be working on it and it's, it's 5.32 and the site goes down and I have a moment of panic, don't panic. It's just because we're turning it off for the night, um, but it will be back up at 7.30 the next day. This slide has information about our help desk. You can reach us at uh, support at tdl.org again, as well as a web form on our website, which is a great way to submit help desk tickets because it allows you to provide lots of good information for us. And we have a toll free number that you can call as well. That help desk is staffed um, during business hours, during the work week, um, and we try to get back to you no later than by one business day um, with a resolution to any question or problem that you have. There is also a lot of additional training and documentation available for OJS. We run a kind of later version of OJS version two and PKP has done a whole series of videos uh, called the PKP School. You'll see some for version two and some for version three. Uh, the journals that we host are, version two is much more relevant for, um, so look for those. They're all on YouTube and also on the PKP site. And I have uh, links here to some of those. PKP also maintains extensive documentation that is very, very helpful for new journals. And I've also included a link here to a list of all TDL hosted journals. And finally, just to note that um, OJS3 is out. It is a major rewrite of OJS and it looks great. Um, we've done some initial investigations, but we're not going to be ready to do upgrades probably until the new, after the first of the year. And part of the reason for that is that because it is a major rewrite, it will strip out all formatting and um, any CSS customizations 
that um, journals have done on their own. Uh, none of that will carry over after the upgrade. And so we have some communications and, tr and communications planning and training to do with some of our more highly customized journals before we're ready to do um, upgrades of everything. But it is a nice, it will be a nice upgrade when it happens. And in the meantime, um, we have, uh, you know, a really good, highly functioning uh, software platform available for folks. All right, and that is my last slide. We do have a couple minutes for additional questions and or thoughts. I'm happy to to hear them. Any any further questions? Going once. Okay. Well, thank you all for attending today. I hope this was somewhat helpful in giving you an overview. As you have questions, um, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Thank you for being here. And um, this has been recorded, so we'll post it to YouTube and you can refer to it as needed. Thanks everybody so much. Look forward to talking to you again soon.